Good morning, everyone. Welcome to round two, second day of our Sergeant virtual instructor-led training. We're going to be talking about exit devices, access control products today. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to get into uh, door control and auxiliary locks. My name is Tom Seidel. Welcome to this Asa Abloy Academy presentation. Session is planned to last about four hours in total. We might end up a little bit earlier uh, on the second half. We'll be taking a break at the top of each hour, as well as a uh, hour break uh, around lunchtime. We will have uh, question and answer time. You can type your questions and answers in the Q&A section. I will also be unmuting everyone to allow you to uh, speak freely. Uh, it's an open forum, so if you have questions, you can either speak up or type them into the Q&A. The session is being recorded, will be available online, uh, for you to listen to within 24 hours. You will also receive an email uh, stating that you had come to the uh, class, and also you can link back into the academy to get your uh, certificate, which will remain in your transcript. So the agenda for today, we'll go over the exit devices overview of why we use exit devices, as well as applications, industry requirements. We'll go through Sargent's product overview. We'll do an explanation of the part numbers and options. We will also do some uh, pricing and part number exercises. We'll then jump into access control products. Uh, during the exit device section, we will also talk about Sargent's multi-point locking devices and the applications for those as well. Part two will be door control. We're gonna talk about door closers. Why are door closers used? Sargent's products, part numbers. We'll do a pricing exercise. And then we will get into Sargent's auxiliary locks as well as our behavioral health products. So let's get started. Why are exit devices used? Before we dive into uh, Sargent's product offerings, let's talk about the device. Where did the device come from? I listed out four tragedies where there were major issues where people were hurt, people were injured, people were killed. Uh, the first one was a Iroquois theater fire in Cleveland, I'm sorry, in Chicago. And there were 596 people that were killed in that fire. Uh, the problem with the building is there were not enough exits in the building. Some were behind curtains. Some of the doors swung in instead of out. And the theater was overcrowded. A fire actually started on the stage in the uh, lighting fixtures. And there was supposed to be a fire curtain that was dropped in that event. But the person who operated the fire curtain was sick that day and nobody else knew how to operate it. And the fire came in and just took over the entire auditorium. And the people that were killed were mostly the ones in the balconies. The uh, Lakeview in Cleveland, that was a school. And the problem was the building design. The building was not built with any kind of fire breaks. So it allowed the fire to spread around the entire school. Uh, the school had an open stairway in the middle and there was only two exit doors they were in swinging. So the students pushed against the doors and perished there trying to get out of that school. Most popular uh, of these is probably the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. It was in the Garment District, and the workers were basically locked in the building because the owner was worried about these young girls that worked there stealing from them. And a fire started and all the stairwells were locked and the workers couldn't escape. They were mostly young girls aged 16 to 23. And of the deaths, a lot of the uh, young girls burned or jumped out of the windows to their death. Uh, the Coconut Grove nightclub fire in Boston, 492 people died in that. And it was a fire 
inside of the uh, nightclub that caught the decorations on fire. The decorations were made of flammable materials. And there were not enough emergency exits. The ones that were there swung inward, and there was a revolving door in the front of the building, not designed to allow people to get out. So people ended up piling against those doors and, again, perished. So these tragedies led to building codes being created. And the building codes stress the requirements and the quantity of emergency exits and the direction of swing, as well as fire ratings within the building, how to break the building into fire zones so that people don't get hurt. And when we talk about the standards related to our industry, we talk about international building codes. IBC has specific requirements for a, uh, for a building. NFPA breaks that building into fire zones to protect the building. NFPA 101 and IBC talk about life safety and how to protect the occupants and save them. And basic information, the doors have to swing in the direction of egress travel when serving an occupant load of more than 50 people. IBC also says in most applications that a uh, building serving or a room serving 50 or more people has to have an exit device on it as well. The doors must have an obvious method of operation. You need to be able to look at that door and get out that door immediately without thinking about how it operates. The device must be mounted between 34 and 48 inches above finished floor. And the actuating portion of the device has to extend at least half the width of the door. So if it's a 48 inch door, the actuating portion of that device has to extend at least half the width. So bear that in mind. Uh, if you have an oversized door and you're trying to use a stock three foot exit device on it, uh, I've seen that application. I've, uh, I've known of some of my customers that had done that in the past. And if that actuating portion does not extend half the width of the door, then you have a problem. So a little bit of history on the exit device. I will go back to that 1903 uh, Iroquois uh, theater fire in Chicago. There was a fella who was to have attended that matinee at the Iroquois theater. His name was Carl Prinsler. Carl Prinsler was a salesman for a company called Vonnegut Hardware. And he was in Chicago on sales and ended up, he thought he was going to be stuck in Chicago, so he got tickets for the theater. And this was the newest, latest, greatest, beautiful, opulent theater. And as it turns out, he was able to get train tickets on an earlier train out of town and was not able to attend. And had he attended, he would have been in that fire. And that uh, information kind of haunted him. So Carl Prinsler made it his life's work to come up with a device that helped in those applications. He was a hardware guy, much like uh, everybody on the phone call here. We're all hardware people. So Carl Prinsler worked for a company called Vonnegut Hardware in Indiana. And between Carl Prinsler and a neighbor of his, Henry DuPont, who was an engineer and architect, they came up with a product. And that product was sold through Vonnegut Hardware. You can put all those names together and come up with the first exit device manufacturer, who is, in fact, our biggest competitor, Von Duprin. Von Duprin makes a wonderful uh, exit device, and uh, I'd like to think that uh, we have done them proud in our uh, designs as well. So let's talk about exit device styles. There's two different types of exit device out in the industry. Uh, it's called the push pad or the touch pad type device. And you'll see either a full cover or a wide style type exit device, or you'll see a narrow cover or a narrow style exit device. The narrow style exit devices are normally used on situations where you have a uh, aluminum storefront type door with a very thin lock rail on it, or if you have a door with a panel in it, the full cover type exit devices are used on most other applications. We also offer in that push pad what they call a utility grade, which is more of a 
heavy duty, but not front facing. You would put them in areas uh, in a building like the back of a warehouse where aesthetics are not as important as functionality. The other type of device is a crossbar type exit device. They make that in a wide style or a flush uh, type application as well. You can use those in full glass doors and narrow style uh, full glass type uh, as well. The difference between the crossbar and the push pad, uh, the push pad is much more flexible as far as applications. The crossbar type device is older technology. You can't get electronics in it. Uh, I always say the rule of thumb is for crossbar exit devices, use them where you have to. If you're doing a historic renovation where you're trying to match a look. Otherwise, the uh, push pad type device is a better application because you can do a lot more with it. So let's talk about the testing. What are the requirements through BHMA ANSI? Again, we talked about ANSI being the American National Standards Institute, BHMA being the Builders Harbor Manufacturers Association. This is the testing that each device has to go through to be grade one. First of all is the cycle test. Cycle testing on a grade one exit device is 500,000 cycles. If you remember when we talked about the cylindrical locks and the mortise locks the other day, for grade one, that's a million cycles. So we're asked, why only 500,000 cycles? It's a very good question. The reason is, it's Builders Harbor Manufacturers Association, and that is comprised with every manufacturer who makes an exit device. And they all have to be in complete agreement in order to make a change. So every manufacturer would have to agree to raise that cycle testing information. And if one says no, then it has to stay. The other answer, uh, when we talk about dogging an exit device, they say that an exit device can be dogged half the time in a non-fire rated application. Think about storefront doors. So that's why they keep that at a, a lower, uh, lower cycle test. The other testings that an exit device goes through is pushing on the uh, bar. An exit test, you have to have a 15 pound maximum force to actuate that device. Now we're seeing uh, changes in code now, starting in the West Coast, California has now adopted a five pound maximum force test. And we've addressed that, uh, we'll show you when we do the options, there is a option for that five pound maximum force. They also test the device for bind, they do test it for security as well with a 400 pound uh, foot pound pull force on the handle on the outside. They test the cylinder. The cylinder actuation has to be 15 pound minimum. And the force to latch door is four and a half pound max. So talking about this testing, Sargent has always done above and beyond testing. The cycle testing for Sargent's exit devices. The 8800 series exit device has been tested over 54 million cycles. The 8900 series exit device has tested to 51 and a half million cycles. The 56 dash, which is our electric latch retraction uh, motor actuated device has been tested to 13 million cycles. The 8700 surface vertical rod has been tested to 20 million cycles. Our MD 8600 has been tested to 20 million cycles. And our 30 series exit device has been tested to 11 million cycles. So if you look at what Sargent's doing here, it's well above and beyond the requirements of ANSI BHMA. Fire ratings on an exit device. Now these are what you would see on the usually latch edge of the exit device. We have what we call panic rated devices as well as fire rated devices. The top one happens to be for a sister company, Corbin Russwin, that is UL listed as panic hardware. Panic meaning it allows you out, it's been tested to meet the certifications of panic hardware. The bottom one is a Sargent 
UL Fire Exit Hardware, which means it can be used on a fire rated door. Fire rating versus panic rating. A fire rated door has to have a fire rated exit device. The fire rated exit device is listed for both fire and panic. A standard non rated is rated only for panic. And you cannot use the devices in the other application. So if you have a fire rated exit device per NFPA 80 requirements, you cannot use a fire rated device on a non fire rated door. And likewise, you can't use a non rated on a rated door. Again, I know some stocking distributors that only stock fire rated devices. Uh, by all rights, uh, you're not supposed to do that per NFPA 80. Dogging. What we're talking about is depressing the push pad and retracting the latch bolt and then holding the latch bolt mechanically back. That's called dogging. So the standard for non-fire rated application would be a hex key dogging where you would have a hole there in the back of the device and you press the bar down and you turn it with a hex key. The downside to that is anybody that had that hex key could then dog the device. So in public buildings, uh, schools, hospitals, we would always recommend using the bottom method, which is cylindrical dogging. There's a key cylinder that would then turn and dog the device. So the only people that could dog that device would be people that had the key. Fire rated devices would not, not have either of those devices. Uh, being that a fire door has to be closed and latched at time of fire, holding a latch back mechanically would not be allowable. However, there are electrical modifications that possibly could be done to allow that to work. Let's jump into Sargent's nomenclature. Again, their nomenclature is very easy. The first two digits discuss how the devices, um, the series. The second digit tells you the mounting for the device. So Sargent has four different series of device, the 20, the 30, the 80, and the 90. And then we look at the mounting, the three, the four, the five, the six, the seven, the eight, the nine. That would tell you how that device is mounted and how it operates, be it a rim type lock, be it a mortise type, be it a surface or concealed vertical rod type device. This afternoon, when we get into door closers, we'll look at the different series of uh, closers that Sargent offers. They do have seven different type of closers. And again, that's all based on your application. So you will start with the either three or four digit no, uh, number, which is the series of closer. And then the next digits will specify the arm mount or type. And with Sargent, again, the options, when you're adding options to one of these products, it's done via prefix. Sargent has a long list of prefixes that are applied to each one of these uh, type of devices. And it's a very easy way to add your additional features that you want with a standard device. The, the, uh, it's usually a two or three digit code that allows you to specify your options. Very easy to work with. So let's dig in. Part numbers for exit devices. Start with the series, and then the style width and mounting, then function. The trim is then specified as part of the product number behind it. Any options would be prefix. Part numbers for door closures. Again, start with series, then your arm type. That size would be specified as well. Options are added by prefix. So the two that we're showing you here, the exit device, the first eight tells you it's an 80 series device. The second eight tells you it's a rim mount wide style device. The 13 is the function, which is a classroom slash entry type function. ETL specifies the required trim for the device. The part number for the door closer starts with the series and then arm type. 281 is the series, that's a 281 door closer. P9 specifies a parallel arm. This is a review of the function numbers. We're concentrating on the center column there. 
the exit device example that we have in 8815, that 15 tells us on the exit device function, it is a passage. Those are the common uh, functions for exit devices. The 15 is a passage. The 13 is your classroom slash entry. The 04 is your storeroom function. We'll get into that here a little bit deeper in a, in a few minutes. Let's take a look at the uh, Sergeant 80 series exit device. This is Sergeant's top of the line. I know we talked about the uh, the different uh, testing and you know the 8800 was tested well over 50 million cycles. Uh, the, the lowest number of cycle testing we've done on this uh, exit device series is 20 million cycles. So 20 million cycles above 500,000 minimum requirement, that's, uh, that's pretty significant. And again, when that's important to an architect or an owner, they want a device that's gonna work. And we put it out in paper. We can give you that paper that's documented, independent, third-party tested. And we would love to put this device in a specification against the Von Duprin 99 series, the Precision 2100 series, the Corbin ED5000 series. All of those devices have been tested above and beyond grade one. When we get into the design build type world, the cycle testing requirements kind of go out the uh, window where some manufacturers tested that 500,000 cycles and they shut the machine off because they don't want to know what's going to happen at 500,001 because they've met the minimum requirements. That's what Sargent does is they commit to test above and beyond. The 80 series is available in both wide style and narrow style. You'll see configurations for rim, for mortise, for concealed vertical rod and surface vertical rod. One thing that you'll note with the Sargent standard exit device, it is designed with an anti-walk steel latch bolt. Does not have a dead latch feature as standard because it's designed to not need one. The Strike, it's a solid nylon coated cast iron strike, not a roller strike like other manufacturers have. All exposed parts on the device will be architecturally finished. So if you want stainless steel, it's all going to be stainless steel. If you want brass, it's all going to be brass. One of the unique things about Sargent is the Lexan touchpad that is on the push rail of the device. Again, that gives you a visual indicator of the part where you're supposed to touch. We will sometimes see a specification that requires no Lexan touchpads. That is an option with Sargent. You can actually delete the Lexan touchpad. Uh, it, there's a lot of good reasons for it to be there visually, uh, as well as uh, we can put an antimicrobial coating on that Lexan touchpad as well. So know that uh, you have both options. This device is available both non-fire rated for panic and fire rated for fire exit hardware. We're gonna talk about the electrified options uh, as we move forward. So it allows us to integrate into access control and security systems. Sargent's device has a five year mechanical warranty, two year electromechanical warranty. And to maintain that warranty, Sargent does not require regular maintenance or lubrication on the device. One of our biggest competitors, you'll see it in their literature where they require in order to maintain the warranty, you have to take the device apart periodically and lubricate several spots on the device to maintain that warranty. When we look at the functions of the device in the part number stream, you will see the device and the function all in one line. That means that the functions are controlled by ordering of the device. Options for the device, again, are done via prefix. Let's look at, look at the construction of the device. Okay. The head, the chassis, is all heavy cast material. Latch bolt is a three-quarter inch throw stainless steel Pullman latch. Mounting screws for the uh, head are concealed by the head cover and through bolt to the trim. Lexan push pad is standard, option to remove it if necessary. Hex key dogging is standard on the panic rated devices. 
The rails themselves, architecturally finished, brass, bronze, or stainless steel on all exposed surfaces. Some manufacturers use a aluminum extrusion where you will get a anodized finish on the rail and the very front of the push pad and the head cover and the back cover will be the architectural finish and everything else will be aluminum to match. Know that uh, sergeants, if you're asking for stainless, you're getting all stainless. Sergeant does offer four standard rail sizes and we'll show you how to specify that here shortly. One unique thing about Sergeant is Sergeant will cut the bar to order. If you tell them you want a 32 inch bar, they will cut it that way. Other manufacturers, they have standard sizes and you have to cut it in the field. But Sergeant will do exactly what you ask on the order. That's one unique thing about them. Rail assembly. If you look at Sergeant X device, there are very few moving parts inside that device. Very modular construction. You see the application here uh, of a rim device where you're pushing that rail in, it's hitting the lever and it's retracting the latch. It could not be any more simple than that. And you'll notice there are uh, screws right behind the push rail at the head, which allows you to install just the operating head during construction and then put the rail on closer to the end of the construction phase of the project, which saves abuse and wear and tear on the uh, finish of the device rail. Again, no maintenance is required in order to maintain that five-year warranty. Sergeant's 80 series device is available in four basic types, rim, again, for single doors or pairs of doors with a mullion, the latching goes into the stop of the frame or into the mullion. We have a mortise, which utilizes a mortise lock body, which goes into a standard strike location on the rabbet of the frame. We have surface vertical rod exit devices, which latch surface mounted the face of the door at the stop on the head and into the floor. We do also offer that less bottom rod as an ap application. We also have a concealed vertical rod, which puts that top and bottom rod inside the door. Again, there are features and benefits to using each one of those different mounts, and we'll talk about those in a second. Sergeant offers two different style types. When I say style, we're talking about the latch edge of the door. Our wide style type exit device is our 86, 87, 88, and 89 series. Our narrow style device is an 83, 84, 85 series. We will get into each one of those here shortly. But notice the difference. The actual head and the head cover is smaller on the narrow style versus the wide style. The 80 series exit device model number the wide style versus the narrow style. Our 8800 series is our rim device. Our 8500 series is our narrow style rim device. On the mortise device, the 89 is the wide. We also offer an 8300 in a mortise device. Now that would be a standard deep mortise pocket. It's not a narrow style mortise lock. It would be a standard mounting. Why do we offer that? Architects. Sight lines, if you have a mortise device near some rims on an exterior area and you want to have them all match look wise, that's where you use the 8300. The 8700 is our wide style surface vertical rod. We do not offer a narrow style version of that. The 86 is our wide style concealed vertical rod. And the 8400 is our narrow style concealed vertical rod. Those are our base model numbers for those products. Let's look at applications. Again, a rim device is great for a single door. A mortise device is also great for a single door. The mortise device puts that latch on the outside of the door, allows for possible manipulation and or attack, whereas the rim has the latching and strike on the inside of the opening. It's not susceptible to vandalism or attack. 
uh, surface and concealed vertical rods are normally used on pairs of doors in the applications. So let's take a look at some double door applications. This person's opinion, and I could probably find a good handful of people that would also agree with me, applications for pairs of doors. The best application is using two rim devices and a removable mullion. Reason being, there are less moving parts. As the building settles, you don't need to make adjustments to rods, things like that. You can get more people out of a door that's divided by that center mullion. The kickback that we get is, well, I don't like the look of that mullion in the middle. But when the door is closed, the mullion can kind of hide. If it's an aluminum mullion, it's going to match the architectural finish of the devices. If it's a steel mullion, it can be painted to match the doors. And architects sometimes find it objectionable that mullion's in the middle there when the doors are open. Well, I will refer them back to a uh, test that was done actually by one of our competitors years ago. It's called the funnel effect. And what they determined is that with that divided mullion in the middle, people come to that door, they go to the left of the mullion or the right of the mullion. And in an emergency, by doing that, both doors get opened fully. With vertical rod devices, people gravitate towards the center of that opening. And the doors never get open completely uh, fully, which allows for debris, slow people, things to be stuck behind that door and the doors never get open completely. So we always recommend where we can double doors. So we, we get kickback though. Here's our first device, our 650. A, which is an aluminum mullion. That aluminum mullion has a built-in weather strip uh, with it, which is very nice, very aesthetically pleasing. Our 980 series, that's our steel mullion. And the kickback that we get, owners will say, well, I don't like that mullion because I have to unscrew it and take it all apart every time I want to bring something through. Well, we fix that as well. Our L980 series, lockable mullion, key removable mullion. So instead of having to take a screwdriver and tools to take that mullion out, you have the key, which means that only people who are authorized can then open that uh, mullion and pull it out of the way. We also sell those brackets as a separate item. So if an owner has to take them out for any reason, they can snap that mullion into a receiver right beside the door so they don't lose the mullion. Again, this allows for much better security, much better uh, getting people out of the opening. So that's our L980 series. Our 980S is our fixed steel mullion. In those applications where you're probably not going to be removing it, when we get into do doors that are very tall, you have an ability sometimes to, they call it rock the door open, where you'll take on the pulls on the outside and you'll alternate pulls back and forth. And sometimes with lesser quality exit devices, you can actually rock the latches back on the strike. Happens a lot on roller strikes more than the uh, standard uh, cast strike. But uh, if you can get that tall aluminum mullion wobbling around in the opening, you could sometimes get those doors to spring, sometimes to what they call rock them open. So we recommend on tall applications using our 651 mullion stabilizer, which basically mounts below the head of the device. And what that does, you put one on both sides of the mullion and it holds that mullion in place. It keeps it from being rocked. So that's our application for rim devices on a double door. Again, sometimes we have to argue with the owners or the architects in order to uh, you know, get approval, but it is a better application in, in my opinion. Bear with me a second here. I realized I haven't unmuted y'all.
feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you like and uh, join into the conversation. Let's look at applications for uh, pairs of doors, surface vertical rod. Surface vertical rod for our wide style type device. Our standard is a 8700 series. That is our surface vertical rod device for non-fire rated applications. If you want a fire rated application, that is an option prefix 12 dash can be used on a three hour door, hollow metal, eight foot maximum height. The problem with surface vertical rod devices is the bottom rod. ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, does not allow any hardware on the push side of the door in the bottom 10 inches, which means a surface vertical rod in that area that has to require ADA approval could not have a surface vertical rod. Well, some companies make a ramp that goes over those. That's not exactly the point, but uh, some authorities having jurisdiction may allow that, but we offer a less bottom rod. That is an NB8700. The fire rated version of that is a 12 dash NB8700. And that can be done on a three hour door up to 10 foot high. Reason being is the latching mechanism on the NB device is different than the standard 8700, which I'll repeat that again. The latching mechanism is different on the NB versus the standard, meaning you cannot take a standard 8700 or a 12-8700 and just delete the bottom rods. It is a different product, it's a different device. And I mentioned the ratings uh, on those, uh, that's a metal door. With the wood doors, you would have to refer to the wood door manufacturers to see what they've actually tested and what they've approved. But these have all been tested and approved on hollow metal. I do know that obviously the uh, fire rated devices can be used on wood doors. It's just based on the wood door manufacturers testing requirements, the rating and the height of the door that they've tested. Okay, let's talk about concealed vertical rod. This gets into a little bit of an eye chart, different colors. We have wide style and narrow style applications in non-fire rated and fire rated. We have less bottom rod NB type devices as well. Our first four rows show us the 8600, the wide style in metal door configuration. These are designed for metal doors. So we have our MD8600. Our 12 dash MD8600, which again can be used three hour door up to uh, 10 foot. The NB, no bottom rod, MD8600. The 12 dash NB MD8600. The narrow styles change that from an 86 to an 8400. Shows you what can be done fire rated, non fire rated, double rod or single rod. The Colors there that are slightly green. You see the 8600 for AD, which is aluminum door. We offer that in standard and no bottom rod. We do not offer this in a fire rated application because where it's used would normally be on the aluminum storefront type openings. We have wide and narrow style configurations there. And when we get into our wood door application, that is the uh, ones in the brown color. We have WD8600. We have a 12 dash WD8600. We can also do those in non NB, which is less bottom rod. Again, if it's fire rated, you have to concer concern the wood door manufacturer as far as how they've tested, to what rating and to what maximum size. The wood door devices we also do not offer in a narrow style wood door application. All right. Looking at our mortise applications, again, the mortise application can be used on a single door or on an active leaf of a pair that uh, would be utilizing 
either a surface or concealed vertical rod on the inactive leaf, something like that. So our wide style is an 89. Our fire rated version is a 12 89. We also offer that in a narrow style configuration, which is an 8300 or a 12 8300. Now notice the difference here. It is a full size mortise lock with the narrow style device. I cannot mention that enough because it's very important. You cannot use that on an aluminum storefront door unless you've got a really wide style on that, uh, on that door. Okay, look at the nomenclature here. Sergeant's devices lay out prefixes first. These are not all the prefixes, just a few of them. And then the door type, which applies to concealed vertical rods, MD, metal door, AD, aluminum door, WD for wood door. Then our series type, 83 is narrow style mortise, 84 is narrow style concealed vertical rod, 85 is narrow style rim, 86 is wide style concealed vertical rod, 87 is wide style surface vertical rod, 88 is wide style rim, 89 is wide style mortise. And then the functions, these are just some standard functions. The 04 is a storeroom. The 10 is either exit only or dummy trim. The 13 is the classroom slash entry type function. The 15 is the passage function. And I mentioned that you uh, can order the devices by size. That is the uh, letter suffix there, E, F, J, and G. The E is sizable from 24 to 32. The F is the standard 33 to 36. The J is 37 to 42. And the G is 43 to 48. And if you use that suffix, you will get the full size bar. An E would be a 32 inch bar for a 32 inch door and you would have to cut it down. The F would be 36 and you could cut it down. But Sargent will also allow you to order it by size. So if you need that device to be 38 and a half inches, you could order it as a J rail and cut it down yourself or specify on your order that you want 38 and a half inches and Sargent will build it that way for you. No charge. There's an example here. We have a 12-8713F. The 12 dash tells us it's a fire rated device. The 87 tells us it's a wide style surface vertical rod. The 13 tells us it's a classroom function. And the F at the end tells you it's a rail for a 33 to 36 inch door, which can be confusing because some other manufacturers, that F at the end of the device means fire rated. With Sargent, the 12 dash is where you would signify the fire rating. Okay. Talk again about the commonly used uh, exit device functions. Exit only, there'd be no outside trim on it. Dummy trim would have a lever or a pull that's only operable if the device is dogged. You see that a lot on exteriors of schools where the uh, facilities people will come around and dog the devices and then the students can come in. And then after the students are there, they can then undog the device and the students would have to then gain access another way. Passage, the outside levers unlocked at all times or thumb piece. So you can activate it with the lever from the outside. Classroom, slash entry, the outside levers locked and unlocked by the key on the outside. The storeroom function, or night latch, the outside lever is always locked, requiring a key. And that key could be unlocking the lever to allow you in, and when you remove the key, the lever's locked again. Or that key could just be retracting the latch bolt. Again, we don't recommend using a night latch function on vertical rods because that's asking a little thin brass key to do a whole lot of work. We also offer a classroom security function where it's classroom on the outside, the key locks and unlocks the outside lever. And then there's a cylinder on the inside that also locks and unlocks the outside lever. With every one of these functions from the inside, pushing the push rail gets you out free egress at all times. 
So again, digging into Sargent's functions, we cross-reference those to the ANSI functions. ANSI is how you would check between manufacturers. If you're converting from Von Duprin to here, you look at the ANSI function numbers and make sure that the uh, functions are working the same. So a 04 function is a night latch for Sargent. An 06 is the storeroom barrier free that we talked about. The 10 from Sargent is either exit only or a dummy trim. The 13 is the classroom slash entry. 15 is the passage. And 16 for Sargent is their classroom security function. So let's talk about the trims that will actually mate up against the Sargent X device. We have our 700 series lever trim. The levers are rigid when they're locked. Uh, some manufacturers have what they call a breakaway trim. Some have a freewheeling trim. Sargent is rigid when locked. That's the way it was designed. That's the way it's supposed to work. We can do freewheeling as an option, but again, it's not something that Sargent would, uh, would specify unless somebody asked because the device is very rigid, very strong when locked. The handing on the X device trim can be changed in the field. The trims have a five year warranty, just like the device. Comes with our standard eight lever trim designs. And we do have designer and deco levers available for the extra device as well. So let's take a look at the nomenclature for the trim. Common trim nomenclature here for that 700 series. If you're specifying it with a device, it's ETL. ET is the exit trim. That tells us it's a 700 series exit trim. The last letter signifies the lever style. So you see the standard levers there. All of them except for the A can be used in a right-hand reverse or left-hand reverse application. The A would have to be switched out if you're going from one hand to the other because it is a curved handed trim. So if you're ordering the trim by itself, separate from the device, again, it's a 700 series trim, so it would be a 7, 13, 13 happens to be the function for a classroom, dash 8 ETL. That is how it comes out of the catalog. Let's take a look at the trim lever designs. There are our standard eight levers that are available from Sargent. The A lever is the one it's handed because it has a curve to it. We have the B, the E, the F, the J, the L, the P, and the W. And you'll see these X device trims pretty much correspond and match with the standard offerings from the mortise locks. A couple of them match uh, some of the cylindrical locks as well, specifically the J, the L, the P. Sargent also has their studio collection, which is their decorative uh, levers for that. They're designed to suite with the other decorative hardware in our good design studio, which would be pulls, drawer pulls, hinges, door stops. There are entire suited collections of products that all work well together. Again, this allows Sargent a bit of a design I don't want to say exclusivity, but it is a deeper uh, product offering than our competitors. Our competitors, I know that uh, they do offer some deco levers, but I'm not sure that they can do it in their brand's corresponding mortise or tubular lock offerings. Ours can be done with our tubular locks, with our mortise locks, with our exit device trims, and with all of our access control products. Again, keeping a constant design theme to allow. These products can be used on mixed use, areas where you have you know, commercial and residential, high-end residential spots in the same building. And it gives the architect more of a selection. You know, the eight standard uh, designs would work for you know, a school, maybe, common areas in a hospital, but 
a lot of these trims, when you look at uh, the non-insert type levers without leather or wood wrap or inserts, most of the levers are the same list price as our standard, which gives us a very nice competitive edge. And then sweeting that along with the other products on the job can sometimes win over an architect or more importantly, an interior designer. Those are the guys they really care about this. So distributors, knowing that these are list price the same as the majority of the other uh, trims, don't value engineer them out because you're not saving anything. For the exit devices, we also have different types of pulls, thumb piece trims, offset pulls. And you'll notice the thumb pieces and some of these smaller pulls may not meet ADA. The offset pulls will meet ADA. So know that you do have options there. Looking at our nomenclature series here, we start out with our options. Anything special about the cylinders, anything fire rated would be listed in the options in the beginning. Then our device itself, our series, then mounting, then functions. And then our rail size, we have four rail sizes, then our trim, then our handing, then our finish, and then any other information. If you have a special door thickness, your height, your width. If there's a different, what we call AFF dimension, above finished floor dimension for the uh, vertical rod devices, you, you would uh, need to specify that. Sergeant Standards comes out with a 41 inch above finished floor dimension. If you want something different than that, you have to ask for it. Notable options for the exit device. This again is not all inclusive, but we wanna make sure that you're aware of some of the, uh, the common ones. The 12 dash is for fire rating on the device. 16 dash is a cylinder dogging option instead of hex key dogging. The 19 dash is to remove that Lexan touchpad. 36 dash is for Torx screws. 43 dash is a flush end cap. That's usually something that's specified. Um, there are some competitors out there that have a flush end cap. Sergeant Standard uh, wraps the edge slightly. So we can do the flush end cap as well. That's a 43 dash. 76 is a knurled lever on the outside. NB is for less bottom rod on your surface vertical rod and concealed vertical rod devices. GL is for a guarded latch, a dead latching type latch bolt. Again, Sergeant Standard is designed to be non-dead latching. If you ask for the GL, that would be something that would be specified. And we can match it with that GL prefix. And again, special height, width, or door thickness options you would specify above finished floor, you would specify. And the most recent addition, again, is our 5CH prefix, which is the five pound pressure release force for the rail. Again, this is starting in uh, codes in California. And like every code, it starts on the West Coast, comes to the East Coast, and then eventually it hits the whole country. Uh, there are compelling reasons you know why they're asking for this five pound pressure release and there are possibly compelling reasons to, uh, to question it. So know that we can do it. There are uh, series that these are uh, applied to. The catalog will give you all that information on which ones can meet that 5CH. Uh, mostly it's the wide style devices and the rim in uh, narrow style. So access control would require some electrification for the devices. Let's talk about electrification. I don't believe that there's anything that our competitors do electrical modifications that we can't do as well. AL is an alarmed exit device. That puts a battery operated piezo alarm in the rail. You push on the rail, the alarm goes off, you have to come with a key and reset the device. Uh, can be remote monitored as well. But again, that's more for notification, crowd control. You're not stopping anybody from getting out of an opening. 
bolt position, latch bolt position monitoring. It's a 53 dash. That's telling you if the latch bolt is retracted or projected. Security systems sometimes want to know that. Uh, outside trim monitoring or signaling. That's 54 dash to tell you if somebody's turning the lever on the outside. Kind of a request to enter switch. The 55 dash is a request to exit, which is monitoring your position of your touch bar. Again, send a, sending a signal out that somebody is depressing the push rail and trying to exit the building. The 56 dash is our motorized electric latch retraction, which is used in access control uh, quite a bit, where you present your valid credential to the outside of the opening. It pulls the latch back and allows you to pull the door open. Electric dogging is a 58 dash. The 58 dash has a magnet in behind the push rail of the device. And that, when activated, the push rail will stay in until the power goes out. Applications for that, I see those in theaters, in the, you know, the back doors of theaters where, not the back doors, but the, the, the entry that allows you to go out into the lobby areas. If those are fire rated doors, you have to use an exit device because those rooms are usually much, uh, you know, larger than 50 occupants. So we had a question that popped up, is electric dogging allowed at fire rated doors? Yes, electric dogging can be used on fire rated doors as long as it's tied into the fire alarm system. So if the building power goes out, or if the fire alarm goes off, that magnet shuts off and allows the latch to operate. So both latch retraction and electric dogging can be used in those applications as long as they're tied into the fire alarm system. Now the 57 and the 59 dash are delayed egress systems. The 57 dash is being used with an outside device, a maglock. The 59 dash is a self-contained delayed egress type device. And what we're talking about delayed egress is you're not supposed to be keeping people in a building. An exit device is to get people out in an emergency. Well, you put a delayed egress in certain areas where you don't want people to be able to freely egress a space. Think about back doors on retail. You don't want somebody in an electronic store to be able to grab items and run out the back door. You want to slow them down. And what that would do is delay their path for 15 or 30 seconds, depending on what's allowable by the authority having jurisdiction, and if even it is allowed by the authority having jurisdiction. So if you don't think 15 seconds is a long time, try standing at a door with stolen goods for 15 seconds while there is a alarm blaring from the device. There can also be other alarms and other flashing lights that are attached into that system. It is an eternity for those 15 or 30 seconds. So the 59 dash is a self-contained. The 57 dash is when it being used with an auxiliary maglock. And again, there are other applications for this as well. Uh, think about uh, dementia areas in hospitals where you'd have patients that you really don't want to get off of the floor. But if a fire happens, then you need to be able to get them off that floor easily. But if the patient comes up to that opening, <clears throat> excuse me, and depresses the, uh, the rail, that could be sent to a remote nurse station to signal that someone is trying to get out. Now there are ways to shunt that from the inside. The uh, access control system, could have a credential there or a keypad that would turn off that delayed egress to allow staff to go out at, at that opening. Again, it would be tied into the fire alarm system to uh, allow free egress if the fire alarm went off. We also do offer uh, electric outside trim control, which would fail, be fail safe or fail secure. So power locked or power unlocked. And that is by the uh, trim number for the X device and the function itself on the X device. Exit device keying options. Sergeant provides a cylinder with their devices as standard. It's either going to be a 34 type rim or a 41 series with a standard fixed core LA keyway unless you request something different. 
if you need one of our other uh, key systems, degree, signature, or XC, you could get those in the, as an option. We also have small format housings and cylinders available as well. The large format, again, we talked about that before, is Sargent's standard Sargent exclusive size cylinder can be provided with cylinder, without cylinder, with uh, temporary construction cores. There are several different options. We can also supply the Sargent uh, X device with our competitors' uh, keyways. Again, the catalog will give you the information on that, uh, what is available directly through Sargent. You can also order it less cylinder to put yours in. With the mortise cylinder, I will warn you that you should use the proper cam on the back for it to operate correctly. That was our 80 series type device. Let's take a look at uh, some of our other devices uh, that we offer. The 90 series is Sargent's uh, traditional crossbar type X device. It is certified grade one. It is available rim, mortise, surface vertical rod, and concealed vertical rod in fire rated applications as well as non fire rated applications. Architectural finishes uh, there are several different trim options, levers, pulls, offset pulls, things like that. Device carries a one year warranty. Now, when we talk about a crossbar device versus a push pad type device, the push pad device has many other features available for it. You can do a lot more with a push pad type device than you can with the crossbar. As far as electrification, as far as cylinder dogging, things like that. Where I would use a crossbar device is historic renovation. If I'm trying to match a look or a design that is existing, or crossbar X devices also work great in applications where you have a full glass or a planton uh, molding of some sort on the face of the door. The rails themselves kind of uh, lend themselves to the possibility of being able to chain you know, pairs of these things shut. So again, I wouldn't put it into a new school. I wouldn't put it into a hospital any public space like that, that you could be asking for trouble. There are trim configurations that are available for the device. The ET trim, the same as the 80 series trim, as well as the thumb piece and offset pull type trims. Uh, also work with that as well. I'm not spending a whole lot of time on the 90 series. Let's take a look at our economy utility grade type devices. Sargent has two of them, the 20 series and the 30 series. And again, those limited applications, we only offer these in rim and surface vertical rods in fire rated and non fire rated devices. Painted finishes. Trim options uh, where you can go down to a key and knob, key and lever, or wing pull configuration. Uh, there's several different functions available in each one of those. The difference between the two, if you look at them, the ones on the top, the push rail goes the entire width of the device. That is the 20 series. The 30 series is designed to look a little bit more like the 80 series where the push rail only uh, extends uh, about three quarters of the device. It matches the modern style. The conjecture was that the 30 series would replace the 20 series, but we still sell a lot of both of them. So they are still both available. No electrification, not a lot of uh, additional features can be added to this device. Just this is your bare bones, your basic. You're trying to fill a need in the back of a warehouse, you know, Back of buildings where aesthetics aren't important, but they need to work. Right. 
now that we've gone through the series of products, let's do some part number streams and pricing. We need the following. We need a rim exit device, classroom function with electric latch attraction for a 34 inch wide door, L lever trim with a degree level one cylinder in a brushed stainless finish. If you're following along with the catalog and or the price book, let's walk through it. Our device series is an 8800 rim, wide style. Function is going to be an 8813. 13 is that classroom function. The electric latch attraction prefix is a 56 dash. What size rail are we gonna use for a 34 inch door? That would be our F rail. We're gonna ask them to cut it in a factory to 34 inches. Our trim is an ETL, ET exit trim, L, L lever. We need to specify our handing, right hand reverse, left hand reverse. Our finish is 32D. And we asked for a degree cylinder for that, DG1. Comes out as a DG1, which is our degree level one patented cylinder. This is what that part number stream looks like. DG1-56-8813F. dash dash ETL by the hand, by the finish, by the door size. So let's take a look in our price book. We're going to be jumping into the current price book, finding uh, exit devices. The 8800 series starts on ED33. So let's take a look. ED3300 has the 8800 series devices. We find the model number in the left hand column. And we come across to the column to find the proper lever trim in finish. You'll notice that on the ET controls, all of our standard level levers, as well as our coastal levers and the studio collection levers, except for the Gramercy, Worcester Park and Grant Park, I'm sorry, Worcester Square and Grant Park are all priced the same. So it would be that far left column. If you get into the Gramercy, the Worcester Square, and the Grant Park, there is a separate price for those. So we want to find our 32D finish, which would be in the left, far left column. We come across list price is 2448 for that device. Now we need to price the options. The options are on the facing page, Sergeant's price book is laid out very well. So your series of device that you're using, the page directly before that will have the options for it. So we're going to go to ED32. ED32, we find the 56 dash in the left column, we go across, we find the list price for that is 852. We find the DG1, and here's the secret, the DG1, the patented level one is the same list price as our standard legacy keying. When we talked about keying the other day, this is a no brainer to add into a new system. You're giving that owner patent protection, protection that their keys aren't going to be copied. So we take a look at that. We add our 852 to the 2448. The list price for that device is $3,300. Let's take a look at another one. Next device. We need a surface vertical rod, classroom function, less bottom rod, fire rated. We want a deco lever on the outside, MA. We want to use our standard cylinder, polished bronze finish. Let's take a look. Now the picture I'm showing you is of a 30 series. I did that more for the uh, the finished look than I did for the uh, thing. I was hoping uh, maybe someone would catch that. 8700 series vertical rod is what we're actually using. Because it's a classroom function, it's a 13. Because it's fire rated, that's a 12 dash. For less bottom rod, it's NB. The size is going to be our standard F for 36 inch we didn't ask. Our handing, or I'm sorry, our uh, exit device trim would be an ET exit trim MA for the lever. Our hand 
right hand reverse, left hand reverse needs to be specified as well. Our finish is an 09 is polished bronze. And the cylinder is included standard six pin with Sergeant X devices. You do not have to specify it. So our part number stream looks like this, a 12 dash, NB 8713F, ETMA by the hand in the 09 finish. Let's take a look in our price book. Uh, the 8700, the NB87 specifically, are listed out on page ED29. We come down and we find the model number for the device. That's an 8713. We come across to our finish, which was an 09 finish. That list price for that finish in the standard levers. The MA is still considered, even though it's studio collection, it's, stand, it's standard pricing. 3142. Now we need to look at the options here. We did ask for fire rated device, so we're going to go to the opposite page, the ED29. Find our option for our UL fire label devices. $184. So $3142 plus $184. Our price is $3,326. Now, again, that includes our standard conventional cylinder. LA keyway is probably what you'll get if you don't ask. That is our standard stock keyway. If you want something different than that, you would have to specify it. If you wanted one of our uh, other key systems, a signature key system would be a 10 dash, XC would be 11 and degree would be DG. Know that you would have to add that in order to get that. All right, let's move forward. Let's take a look at some of Sergeant's multi-point lock products. We're gonna touch on them briefly. Sergeant offers the FM 6100 series. It's a multi-point auto dead locking system. It's developed to protect lives while securing community shelter or safe room areas. It's perfect for uh, community refuge areas where people seek protection from windstorm events. The latching points activate automatically when the shutter is closed and retract with one single motion upon exit. This is designed for both in-swing and out-swing applications. Can be part of a windstorm solution. Now, when I say windstorm solution, this is paired with a door and a frame and the rest of the other hardware as a solution. It's been tested as a solution. So I can't say that you can go out and buy a door from someone and add this to it and it's a windstorm device. It's not, it has to be tested that way. It is available three hour, fire rated as well. And if you look, there's a heavy duty trim on both sides that activate it. There are a couple different functions that you can get. Next device is our 7,000. Our first device, the 6100, had three-point latching. This is a two-point auto deadlock system. And the difference between this, it could be used on pairs of doors independently of each other, which would eliminate the need for flush bolts and coordinators on paired openings. Okay, several different trim applications for this. We can do electrified trim, electric latch retraction, and monitoring on this thing as well. Applications for aluminum, wood, and metal doors. We can also do just single point top only latching, which would be an NB option. And uh, the 12 dash would give you a fire rating on this as well. So applications, you know, security, critical infrastructure areas, access controlled, independently operated pairs. This gives you something that uh, if you don't need an exit device on that door, but you need uh, access control, latch attraction, this gives you that option. Again, it can, be F, uh, it can be used in those areas where you're trying to protect things. You have a top and a bottom rail, uh, latch. Our 7300 series multi-point lock is a three-point locking system developed again for certain applications 
The FM option is part of our windstorm solution when used with our windstorm products. Our BL option for this is part of our blast resistant solution. And as you see, it's built around the standard 8200 series mortise lock from Sargent. And it adds additional top and bottom locking. It's a very robust uh, solution. Again, you're going to use that in those critical infrastructure areas, in those high security applications, as part of a complete solution for blast and windstorm. Just adding this product to standard doors may not get you what you need. We wanna make sure that if we're selling something, it's sold as a product, proper solution. The FM 8700 series multi-point lock is again, it is a door hardware that is designed for security in shelters during you know, events, windstorm problems. Again, it's part of a complete solution. It is a different bolt than our surface vertical rod device. It looks a whole lot like a vertical rod device, but it gives you that one means of egress from the inside with a push rail. So on your larger community shelters, things like that, that would give you on an outswinging door, a windstorm solution. It is a two point latching system that bolts automatically when the door's closed. Again, part of a windstorm solution. Or if you're using it by itself, it can be used you know, in those safe rooms and corporate campuses, things like that, where you get a very durable double bolt. Any questions on our multi-point latches? We're going to jump into some of our access control solutions. And this is a very, very brief primer on access control, but I want you to be aware of all the products that Asa Abloy makes because it's not a one size fits all. We don't make one product and try to put everybody into that same basket. Sargent has a bunch of different products, different variety of uh, very different products, various platforms, different applications. We have standalone products. We also have complete online systems. And some of the slides you'll see that the authorized channel partner and certified integrator means that the products are only sold through distributors that have been trained and understand how it operates, how it works. Can only be installed by an installer that has been trained on how to install and how to commission the product. And again, this is, these different uh, platforms have specific infrastructure and software that would need to be written to by different access control manufacturers, which is why the integrators need to be taught, which is why the distributors need to be taught. So we make sure that we put the right product in the right application. So taking a look at our security continuum, our products, we talked about mechanical credentials already, the keys and different key systems. That is your basic access control. And as we go across, and up, we add different features, different benefits, and the price you know, can increase as we go across these different technologies. So we're jumping from our standard mechanical credential, from our standard keypad lock. And we're going to take a look at our next product offering, our keypad type lock, our offline type lock. We start out there, with our profile series from Sargent, which is affectionately referred to as the clown foot. It was designed uh, to meet the architectural requirements and the needs of its day. And we still sell a ton of these products. Uh, they are great for what they do. There's two different series of our standalone uh, profile series. The VG 1.5, the G1 is a 2000 user software controlled offline access control system. The LK series is a 100 user standalone keypad only system. We also have a KP lock, which has an entirely different look. It's more of a sectional type trim where the keypad is separate from the lock. Know that it exists. When we get into 
anything above the 100 user, you can start adding other features. The G1 series, the G1.5, can be keypad operated, can be used with prox technology or radio frequency technology, the RF technology, meaning you could have a fob that you could use to lock down the outside trim. Sargent offers several different prox and key, fat, uh, key fob credential options. The 2000 user can be audited. You have to use what they call a data transfer device, and you program that G1 series with a data transfer device as well. It's the easiest way to do it. But to make any changes, you have to walk to each opening and make changes to every opening. It's an offline system. It's what we call sneakerware, meaning you walk from door to door and you upload information, you download information. It's not all tied into a central computer. We use a basic Solo Plus software for management. You can put all the information in. You use a data transfer device to load it into the lock and to audit the lock. It's convenient for small basic access control. The LK series is great for crowd control. Doctor's offices where you don't want the patients to be able to walk back into the uh, examination area, you could put a simple keypad. So the only, only people that could get in would be people that knew the code. You program those locks at the lock. Uh, the 100 user can have audit trail, but you have to use software and a, a transfer device to get the uh, audit trail from it. Same thing with the 2000 series user. So we wouldn't recommend this for large systems. If you need full-blown access control, we do have some products that are in this same profile series. Our VS1 power over ethernet lock is a hardwired access control system power over ethernet. So it powers the lock and sends all the data and information back and forth as well. To get the information to the lock, we would need a raceway through the door as well as a uh, McKinney POE hinge or power transfer device. This is available in mortise, cylindrical, and exit device configurations as well. And again, this is just for prox and I-class and keypad credential options. These products, again, require that extra training of the ACP or the certified integrator. And this is what that looks like. So you have that wire that comes from your access control system. It goes out to your network POE switch, network cable. Just like you plug your computer into a network, the lock plugs into the network and speaks to the computer, to the access control system. It is an online system. It does utilize... Uh, on the mortise and exit device uh, trim configurations, it would uh, use our EcoFlex technology, which is very uh, low energy consumption. So that is a hardwired solution. We also have a wireless solution in the uh, profile series. That's our VS2. This is a Wi-Fi lock. So this lock is a battery powered lock that has intelligence built into it for local decision making. It wakes up a couple times a day, talks to the network and says, this is what happened. This is the audit. This is who came through my door. Do you have any information for me? And then the Wi-Fi will send the signal back to the lock and say, yes, we're taking these people in and out of the system. We're taking access away from these people. This is a great product for retrofit, hard to wire locations. It utilizes a building own standard existing 802.11bg Wi-Fi network infrastructure. Again, like the other profile products, it works on Prox, I-Class, and keypad credentials. And that's what it looks like. You have this battery-powered lock, talks to that network router, gets information from the computer, wakes up a few times a day. The beauty of this lock, say the building power goes down, the access control system computer that houses it breaks and the access control system is offline, well, this lock will still operate exactly as it was last programmed and it will store all the audit events. So when the system comes back up online or power comes back to the building, it will wake up, talk to the system and get any updates from the system and give all the audit information. Again, these products all require authorized channel partners and certified integrators. So these are offline. I'm sorry, 
they're online. This is a near online system. It wakes up, talks back and forth. The more you operate it, the more the batteries wear out. We also offer another wireless solution, which is our PR100, which is an Aperio system. The Aperio uses a wireless communication between the lock and a hub, which we mount somewhere near radio communication. The lock talks to the hub. The hub is hardwired into the access control system. The lock itself uses six batteries. There is no wiring through the door. It's what it looks like. We're talking electronically to this Aperio hub. The Aperio hub speaks to the access control, makes real-time situa uh, decision situations. Again, the profile series is only Prox, I-Class, keypad credential options. Authorized channel partner, certified integrator. Moving further, we're going to jump into what we call our campus solution, which is Sargent's passport type products. And if you look about the profile of the lock is much different than the, pen, than the profile series. It looks entirely different. That's because it's designed different. It does different technologies as well. This standalone product can be offline, can be Wi-Fi, can be PoE, as we talked about, power over Ethernet or Wi-Fi. It's designed specifically for the university campus type environment. And it combines the ability to use a mag stripe, a pin code, or multi-class reader technologies. Now, the profile only work with keypad, prox, or iClass. When we start talking about multi-class readers is when we start going into smart card technologies. Campuses still use MagStripe. MagStripe is the oldest technology out there. And it's quite hackable. It's the same thing as your ATM card. All that information is stored on tracks that are recorded onto a magnetic uh, strip in the card. And they use that for the student, for their ID, for their purchasing, for their medical information, as well as access control. So looking at that, being that that technology is going back several years, some campuses are deciding to go to a smart card technology, to near field communications, things like that. And we're able to integrate a reader into this passport series in the Wi-Fi and the PoE that will allow them to migrate away from MagStripes eventually. We can give them a reader here that would work with the newer technologies as well as still allowing the, ac the old access control, meaning when they're ready to migrate to the next technology, they don't have to replace the locks. Yeah, and this is driven, uh, it works with Asa Abloy's Persona Campus software and also works with third-party software that integrates into the campus's uh, systems. Again, this is getting very, very deep. I don't want to go too deep. Just know that we do have a product that's designed specifically for the campus environment in a couple different form factors. Now, when we get further up our, our continuum here, let's take a look at Asa Abloy's wireless solutions, our newest, what we call our Incepta series, which is a different footprint. You see the little different footprint from the uh, profile series where you have a reader that is separate from the lock, self, lock set itself. Works on that same Aperio technology that we talked about, where the lock talks wirelessly to the hub. The hub is what is wired into the access control system. Real-time communication with your electronic access control system. Aperio global technology, which means it's available not just from Sargent, but some of our sister companies as well. There are Aperio locks made by Adams Wright for aluminum storefront. There are Aperio locks that are made for you know, lockers and cabinets and server racks by HES. So this is a global technology that can be used all around the world. It also has a smart credential cache, which basically stores the information 
that allows you to still access openings whenever the system is down for a short period of time, which will keep you in full access control. Having the nicer footprint than the profile series, sometimes the architects like that look a little bit better, but it also has a newest reader technology, which is HID's multi-class, which allows for multi-credential options, smart cards, near-field communications, things like that. It's a much, uh, much prettier look. That's our Aperio Wireless. The locks are battery operated. They talk to a hub, which is hardwired to the access control system, makes real-time decisions. Our next generation of our Wi-Fi product is our IN120, that same Incepta series look. You'll notice this is a, uh, a deco. On that reader, you can put different shrouds around it to make it look a little bit more decorator. It could be white, it could be black, it could be chrome to match the chrome lock. And this is that next generation of Wi-Fi technology. It uses the standard 802.11b G N network infrastructure. This lock also has a built-in privacy button, which is great for shelter in place situations or lockdown. Again, it's a battery operated lock. The decisions are made inside of the lock. If the access control system goes down, the decision making is still made at that lock up until the system comes back online and it, and it talks again. With this technology, it is using much less energy consumption so the batteries last longer, which means you can make this wake up and talk to the access control system. Ideal for those hard to wire locations. No proprietary equipment required. There are companies that make Wi-Fi locks that you have to put an entire new Wi-Fi network in. Again, looking at the technology here, Sargent has a uh, very unique product available in mortise, cylindrical, exit device configurations, utilizing that same HID multi-class technology, smart card technology, near field communication. We're kind of pushing the bar up a little bit. And this is what that looks like where you have your lock that speaks wirelessly to a wireless access point, your Wi-Fi point, talking into your network to your access control system. So it wakes up, the system tells it how it's going to operate for the next several hours. The lock talks to the access point and says, this is what happened the past couple hours. And in those situations where the access control system goes down, you still have a battery powered lock that will operate. So jumping into our PoE, our power over ethernet. Again, it is hardwired into your access control system, plugging into an ethernet port, just like your computer would. Okay, it's a cost-effective online access control system. Uses your standard PoE network infrastructure, simple installation. Now you do need that PoE hinge or power transfer, and going from the profile series to this one, get you that multi-class uh, card reader technology in near field. You have to wire through the door, through a power over ethernet product, hardwired into your access control system. Again, all these products require that additional training. Oh, we had a question pop up here. Is there any plan to have a keypad prox reader for a Perio in the IN series? That is something that is on the, uh, the drawing board. There is a next generation. They're looking to have the keypad, the keypad slash prox reader uh, in that, uh, in that Aperio technology, in, in the uh, Wi-Fi technology, in the Incepta series uh, to allow for dual authentication. So you could present a card and then type a password in. So if your card got lost, somebody would not be able to access it without the, uh, the passcode as well. So yes can be done. Moving forward, our Harmony, which is our integrated Wiegand, which is our hardwired full-time online access control system. So this product is designed to be used in those areas where you want to eliminate all the other products around the opening. 
all these other products that we've talked about do take away the need for a separate request to exit switch, a door position switch, your card reader and your lock and separate locations. What this Harmony device did, in the past you would have your card reader on the wall, you'd have your electric lock, you would have a request to exit switch, maybe in the lock, maybe in a separate uh, box above the door. You'd have a door position switch somewhere else as well. All those things are required by your access control and your security. And you would have to run wire to each location. By going to this Harmony type product, it's all one 12 wire right through the door and everything is built into that lock from your request to exit, your door position switch, your card reader, as well as your electric lock. It's all built into that same platform. And this is available in Prox and iClass SE configurations, mortise, cylindrical, and exit device. Again, this gives you real-time hardwired access control. So you have to wire through the door, through a power transfer or electrified hinge, up to the access control system, full-time online. So this being only Prox and iClass, we needed something similar to our Incepta series, which allows for multi-class readers and near-field communication. We've come up with our SELP10, which does the same thing as the integrated Wigan product, but allows for that multi-class reader technology, smart cards, near-field communication, things like that. Again, wired the same way. All of these products, when we got above our standard profile lock offline, do require the access control authorized channel partner as well as certified integrator programs. So not that we're trying to exclude anybody, but we want to make sure if you're selling it that you understand how it works, what it does, what it doesn't do. And we don't try to pigeonhole everybody into one solution. There are people out there that do make a hardwired lock set, a hardwired uh, integrated type product. There are people that make a wireless configuration, our, our Aperio product, where our lock speaks wirelessly to that Aperio hub. You know, Schlage makes a product, they call it, a, uh, their lock, uh, their AD series has a, what they call a PIM which is a wireless communication. Their PIM is their reader that actually works with the access control system. So the Wi-Fi technology, I know there are people that make a Wi-Fi lock, but their Wi-Fi lock requires a unique infrastructure. Ours will work on the existing infrastructure. So know that there are several different options. We had a question here, how can one get certified? Well, to be certified as a authorized channel partner, you would uh, coordinate that with your local DSS agency. They have electromechanical specialists whose job it is to train the distributor. If your company also does integration, uh, access control, then you would have to be trained as a certified integrator as well. And that would all be done through the local DSS. And we're actually streamlining that process as we speak and uh, making sure that everyone who wants to be trained uh, can be trained. Again, in every marketplace, uh, not every distributor would be uh, an authorized channel partner. Some distributors don't do access control, believe it or not. Uh, other distributors are what they call hybrids, which do the sales and the installers. Uh, there are some contract hardware distributors that are hybrids. So again, the training all comes through DSS and the decisions are made locally. Any other questions on access control? Or exit devices? I do see a couple questions that came in. I will address those now. All right, someone had asked about the recording of the session today. We will be recording it. It will be available within 24 hours uh, on the Academy site. You'll be able to go back through and listen to uh, anything that you might have missed. Door control devices from Sargent.
the purpose of a door closer. Before we talk about the door closers, let's uh, talk about why we need a door, you know, door control. Why do we need a closer on a door? A lot of different reasons. First, fire and smoke doors. If it's a fire rated uh, door, the door has to be self-closing and self-latching as uh, prescribed by fire codes. And a closed door will help prevent the spread of fire and smoke throughout a building. Second is uh, for environmental reasons. A closed door keeps out rain, keeps out the weather, keeps the air conditioning inside the building in July in uh, Arizona. It keeps the uh, snow and the cold weather out of heated buildings in New England in the winter. For security, self-latching door closed properly every time will secure the opening. There's nothing worse than on an access control application where you have a door that's uh, propped open or that doesn't close completely. For sound containment, a closed door limits the spread of sound. Uh, think about applications in uh, schools where you would have music rooms and areas where you've got a seven-year-old practicing tuba. Do you really want to hear that down the hall, right? So sound containment, that's a good reason to have a uh, door control device. Visual limitation. A closed door gives privacy. You don't want to have people you know, peering into your uh, facility and seeing what's going on behind closed doors. And for safety, a controlled door will ensure that the door doesn't slam on someone's finger, will extend the life of the door and frame. Again, a properly adjusted door closer will extend the life of an opening. Things to think about when you're selecting a door closer. Opening and closing forces. They're dictated by ANSI A117 to meet ADA. Um, have to worry about stack pressure in the building. That's the movement of air into and out of the building as doors are open and closed. That can really fight the operation of a door closer. And when we talk about ADA requirements and things that are mandated, we have to really pay attention to uh, how we select the door closer and how we mount that door closer. High winds on the exterior of a building can keep the door open. It won't allow the door to uh, close in certain wind shears. So you'll have to consider what mounting and how heavy that spring pressure is on that door. Same thing with uh, unusually large or heavy doors. It will affect the selection of the closer, but also it will affect whether you'll be able to meet the required opening and closing forces. Uh, aesthetics and arm applications kind of go hand in hand. The key to that is to select an arm that keeps the closer on the inside of the building, inside of the room, away from public view. So that in public spaces, as you walk down the corridor, you don't see the closer or the arm sticking out for the most part. Again, there are going to be applications where that is required, but for the most part, we want to try to keep it as clean as possible. So before we go any farther, let's see how a door closer actually works. This is a rack and pinion type door closer, the same type of door closer that uh, every manufacturer makes. Cast iron closers from Asa Abloy are rugged and reliable, providing millions of cycles with minimum maintenance. But the true durability test comes during those inevitable times when extreme forces are applied to the door and the door closer. Our single piece construction provides uniform strength and wear resistance and eliminates potential leak points. Let's look inside to see what makes this cast iron closer so durable. Here's the basics. Each time the door is opened, the closer arm turns a pinion, which moves a piston inside the fluid-filled chamber. The speed of the piston is controlled by fluid passing from one side of the closer to the other. The valve controls the speed. When the door reaches about 70 degrees open, oil begins flowing through the back check valve, gradually increasing the amount of pressure required to open the door farther. This cushioning effect is called the back check function. When the door is released, the stored energy in the spring pushes the piston back. The fluid is now routed through valves that control the closing speed of the door. 
The sweep speed valve meters the oil flow from wide open to within about 7 degrees of closed. The latch valve then takes over, controlling the last 7 to 10 degrees of the closing swing. The latch and sweep speed of the door can be increased or decreased to obtain the desired door motion. The spring adjust screw may be adjusted to obtain the appropriate closing force and to accommodate for varied door sizes and latching hardware. Our cast iron closers have easily accessible valves for adjusting back check, sweep, and latch speed functions. During the closing motion, internal pressures seldom exceed 50 PSI, but some doors are located in high abuse situations. Examples might be a city high rise on a windy day or school doors that children constantly force to close. In cases like these, extreme pressure builds up inside the closer body. With no way for the pressure to escape, that force can damage the closer, the door, the frame, and the mounting hardware. This is why our unique self-regulating pressure relief valves are so important. Under abusive conditions, the pressure relief valve on the end of the piston senses the extreme pressure and automatically meters the fluid to achieve more normal pressure levels. The self-regulating pressure relief valve cycles rapidly during extreme pressure events to maintain control of the door. Once normal pressures are achieved, the pressure relief valve is no longer active, but ready for the next time the closer is abused. By releasing this pressure, the valve acts as a shock absorber, preventing damage to the door closer, the mounting hardware, the frame, or the door itself. Another unique feature for our cast iron closer is an independent mounting bracket. This bracket allows easy and accurate alignment. Simply install the bracket and attach the door closer. One piece cast iron construction, the unique pressure relief valve system, and the independent mounting bracket. These are just some of the reasons our door closers last and last, cycle after cycle, year after year after year. So, there was a, a little uh, Asa Abloy commercial there, but it does explain the operation of a rack and pinion type door closer. We did also talk about one of our uh, features on our industrial type closers, that is our pressure relief valve. Now you will see Asa Abloy uses those on a lot of our door closers. Our competitors don't have anything similar to that. So you may or may not see specifications that call for our closers as an approved product, but they require less PRV, which is our pressure relief valve. Now it, our closer is designed for that. It actually increases the control of the door closer. So we would recommend and we would probably argue to keep that into a specification. So let's talk about Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, ANSI A117, and how that affects the use of a door closer. The first thing that we talk about in ANSI A117, door closers shall be adjusted so that from an open position of 90 degrees, the time required to move a door to a position of 12 degrees from the latch is five seconds minimum. So we're talking about that sweep speed, the sweep speed or the closing speed from 90 degrees down to 12 degrees. In about that 12 degrees is where the latching speed would kick in. Five seconds maximum, I'm sorry, minimum, five seconds minimum from completely open to about 12 degrees from close. They don't address the 12 degrees to close. That's where the latching speed kicks in. And sometimes if you have a little pressure in the building, you might need to increase that latching speed to allow that door to slam past a gasketing or past a stack pressure in a building. That's why a full featured door closer has that uh, separate sweep and latch valve. Okay, the next thing ADA talks about is opening force. And the first thing it says is, Fire doors shall have the minimum opening force allowable by the appropriate administrative authority, the authority having jurisdiction. That could be a different group depending on the type of building that it is. So fire doors have the minimum opening force allowable by the AHJ. But the maximum force for pushing and pulling open doors other than fire doors shall be as follows. On interior hinge doors, 
five pounds. For sliding doors, it's also five pounds, but for interior hinge doors, which would have a door closer, we wanna have five pounds. And when we talk about the efficiency of a closer and requirements of that, remember that five pounds, because we're gonna talk about that here in a second. BHMA standards. Again, we talked about the standards with all the other products. To be a grade one door closer, the door closer, if it does not have back check, must go through 2 million cycles. If the closer has back check, it's a million and a half cycles. For grade two, it's 1 million cycles without back check and 750,000 cycles without back check. For grade three, it's 500,000 cycles with or without back check. So you can see there's a tremendous difference in the cycle testing of a door closer that has back check because of the protection that it offers to the opening. Also, to meet ANSI cycle requirements, you also have to have a closer that is 60% efficient. And what we're talking about is the power to pull the door closed versus the power to open the door. So if you have five pounds of opening force on a ANSI A117 ADA door, with 60% efficiency, you only have three pounds closing that door which on an interior door might work. On a door that had gasketing or a building that has bad uh, pressure regulation where you have stack pressure between areas of a building, that three pounds of force might not be enough to close. And you'll see closer manufacturers do have certain mounts that will not meet ADA and they list it right in their catalog. So we go above and beyond at Sargent with our door closer cycle testing, specifically on two closers, the 281 and the 1431 closer. The 281 has been tested to 25.7 million cycles. Again, that is well beyond the requirements of ANSI grade one. Our 1431, that is also a uh, industrial slash architectural application. That was been tested to 26 million cycles. We'll get into each one of these closers and we'll talk about the difference between them and the similarities between them. But uh, let's keep going. Let's talk about closer mounting. Four different standard ways you can mount a door closer. And we'll get into the features and benefits of each as well as the uh, bad idea of using them, you know, the, uh, the negatives to using that mount of closer. We have the regular arm, which is on your top left. Below that is the top jam mount. On the right side, you have parallel arm on the top right and slide track on the bottom right. We will get into these uh, specifically and address concerns with them. But let's talk about handing. Some of the specialty and heavy duty arms and applications will require to know whether you're using it on a right hand door or a left hand door. Door closers are always handed from the push side, regardless of how the closer is mounted. If the closer is mounted on the pull side of a right-hand reverse door, we still hand it from the left, from the inside, which would be a left-hand closer. So always, always from the push side. We do not make a reverse bevel door closer. If you put that on your order, they'll probably question you. So let's keep going. The standard tri-pack mount. Sergeant has a, uh, a part number that we will talk about when we get to the arms that is designed for the tri-pack where you can mount it regular, parallel, and top jam. And this is convenient for stocking distributors so that you can send out a standard closer and know that it will work. However, if you're doing a project and you have a submittal, and you're using a tri-packed closer, always specify the mount. Don't leave it up to the installer. The installer is gonna do the same thing they do on every opening and it might not be what the architect wants. And the architects will put things into a specification stating they want the closers hidden from public view. So let's talk about the mounts. Our regular arm mount or standard arm mount. This closer is mounted on the pull side of the door the closer is mounted on the face of the door, and the shoe of the arm is mounted on the face of the frame. 
always pull side mount. The advantage is it uh, allows for 180 degree swing of the door. This is an easy one to install. And we talked about the 60% efficiency. This is the most efficient mounting method for a door closer. The downside to it is that arm sticks 90 degrees off of the face of the door. It sticks straight out. Couldn't use this door uh, as an exterior application because you don't want the closer on the outside of a building. You want to keep it inside and protect it. And there are vandalism concerns. If you put these on a uh, high school, pretty sure the students are going to try to do chin-ups on these. You know, elementary schools, they can't reach them, but high schools, that's where it's going to be. You're going to get a bunch of uh, angst-filled teens, and they're going to want to prove how cool they are by hanging off the uh, door closers. So if this is an application where it was on a stairwell and the closer is swinging into the stairwell, that hides it from public view. It's going into a closet, the same type of situation. It might be a great application. Again, this is the most efficient mounting pull side. Let's look at something from the push side, top jam mount. The door closer mounts on the face of the frame and the shoe of the arm mounts on the face of the door. It is push side. It is efficient. It's almost as efficient as the regular mount. You can not allow 180 degree swing. It gets the closer completely out of the opening. So you have full head room of the opening. One of the disadvantages could be the face of the frame. Certain closers might require a back plate or a larger head on the face, you know, face for the frame. If you have a very deep jam, a deep frame, you might need a special uh, longer reveal arm for a longer reveal depth. And again, the arm sticks straight out. This can be used on exterior openings because it's still on the inside of the door, it's on the push side. Again, more efficient than other mounts. The most popular that we see is the parallel arm. The parallel arm mounts the closer body on the face of the door on the push side. And the bracket, we call it a soffit bracket because it mounts on the stop on the soffit of the frame. And when the door is closed, the arm rides parallel to the face of the door. So it gets the arm out of public view, it kind of hides it. The advantage is the closer swings in with the door, keeps the door, you know, uh, the closer out of the headroom area. The arm doesn't project from the face. And there are several different stop and hold open arms available with this parallel arm. The downside is if you have a glass kit, you might have a uh, light and closer conflict where you need a larger top rail, or you might have to add a drop plate for that. The installation can be a little bit more tricky because you have to preload the arm specially in order for the closer to operate properly. Nothing looks worse than an improperly uh, installed closer uh, arm with a parallel mount where the closer arm is sticking off 45 degrees because the installer didn't read instructions. That happens a lot. And this closer mount is much less efficient than your regular top jam. You can lose about 25% of efficiency. So again, you have that five pound opening force for ADA, your three pound, take 25% of that off and you're down to two and a half pounds, which makes it really, really difficult to meet ADA. Track mount is the fourth style and track mount can be push side or pull side and this is much more uh, of an aesthetics play because the arm virtually disappears you have a bracket that mounts on the stop and the closer mounts on the face of the door on a push application on a pull application the closer still mounts on the door and the track mounts on the face of the frame one of the nice things about it, you can put spring stops and holders inside of the track arm, which makes it nice and, and convenient and pretty. Unfortunately, uh, you have even less efficiency with a track mount closer than you do parallel arm. So that goes down to probably even 30% less efficient. So now you're getting even less. So it's gonna be very, very difficult to comply with ADA 
Uh, I would not recommend using this on an exterior door because it's the least efficient. Now, remember I told you that on a rack and pinion door closer, the track mount is the least efficient mounting. We're gonna talk about a different style closer that is only available track mount that is designed to meet ADA. We'll get there in a couple minutes. The last mount that we didn't talk about in the big four is our corner mount bracket, where the closer itself mounts onto a bracket that is secured on the stop side of the frame on the push side, and the arm itself is attached to the face of the door. That's in an area where you don't have a lot of top rail on your door, or you don't have the availability to mount that closer on the door or on the face of the frame. The downside to this is the closer stays in the opening all the time. The door moves, the closer stays in the middle of the opening, and it could cause you uh, issues with your minimum height requirements for egress codes. Let's take a look at, at what adjusting a door closer does to the opening. We borrowed this video from a uh, sister company, so disregard the, uh, the broken English. No adjustment on the door closer. It slammed against the wall, it slammed shut. Now we're going to adjust the back check. Watch what happens during the opening. Now slowed that closer down and kept it from slamming against the wall. Now we have to do some additional adjustments. Now we're going to adjust the latching speed. Here where that last 12 degrees it was regulated. Now we're going to look at the closing speed or the sweep speed. Slowed it down through the cycle, and now the closing will kick in. In the perfect world, you don't see the difference between the sweep and the latching. This is an optional feature called delayed action or delayed closing, and what it does is allows for people to get through an opening. If you have somebody who is in a wheelchair or has a physical disability, you know that the closer is creeping very slowly closed. It is not holding the door open, it's just allowing it to close very limited time up to about 30 seconds, which will then allow the latching and the sweep to kick in. So if you need any assistance with how to properly adjust a door closer, I know that uh, we do have some videos that uh, one of our academy instructors has put together to uh, show you the, the proper way, especially troubleshooting an opening. Sometimes it's better to start all over. And we will happily uh, do that training for you as well. If you come to any of our uh, future upcoming in-person classes, we go over the uh, door closer adjustments in great detail. Let's jump into product. Let's start with our industrial cast iron door closer. The 281 series is ANSI grade one. It is a true one piece cast iron body. One of our competitors offers a cast iron door closer that's half cast iron and the spring tube is steel that is screwed into it. With the 281, it is a solid one piece, very easy to install. This closer does feature an inch and a half diameter piston. We use brass valves for our uh, closer adjustments. It is multi-size from one to six. Again, you can order the closer from the factory size, you just have to tell us what you want. The unique feature of this closer is the mounting bracket, the quick install bracket that allows you to mount the bracket on the door before you mount the closer body. That closer body weighs a few pounds. And if you're installing one of them, it's not so bad. But if you have a bunch of door closers and you have to hold that body up 
above your head while you're screwing four screws in to hold that closer in place. After a few, you get fatigued. So the des decision was made during the uh, design of this to allow one person to very easily install it. You install the bracket first, and then you put the uh, closer onto the bracket. I had a question here. What does multi-size one to six mean? What we're talking about is adjusting the tension of the spring for different applications, for different sizes of door, for different mounts, you would have a different closer size. You would adjust that closer. And if you have a multi-size, it comes out sized for an interior three-foot door, and you will have to tighten that spring if you're going to a four-foot door. If you're going to a parallel arm versus a standard mount, you have to tighten that spring. And we'll do that for you in the factory. That's what the multi-size means. And distributors, uh, if you're selling a multi-size closer on your submittals, because that's what the installers use, not only specify how the closer is to be mounted, but what size that closer is supposed to be. Because dollars to donuts, most installers don't even mess with the spring. And that could be the first troubleshooting issue if somebody hasn't adjusted a uh, parallel arm four foot exterior closer different than the three foot regular arm mount interior, you could have issues. The closers are non-handed. They do feature pressure relief valves. We talked about that. Closer has a 25 year warranty. This uh, closer body also works in our overhead concealed series, our 270 and 280 series. It is that same cast body that you see there with the same feature set. And let's talk about specifications. When we see architectural specifications for schools, for hospitals, things like that. There's a company out there who makes a really nice closer. They've been around for a long time. They write a lot of specifications too. And their specification for years was the closer had to be cast iron. The closer had to be inch and a half diameter piston. Closer had to go 10 million cycles. Closer had to have a 10 year warranty. And every manufacturer, again, we would push each other. We had to meet that specification. So we have a cast iron body. We have an inch and a half diameter piston. The, uh, the 10 year warranty we had already, but the 10 million cycles, we had to have a third party verify and we kept the machine running. We went past that 10 million cycles, over 25 million cycles. So we put an additional warranty on that closer, raised it from a 10 year to a 25 year warranty. We have that third party documentation. We forced our big competitor to make improvements to their closer and they also raised the warranty on their closer. So at the end of the day, what happened? The owners get better product with a better warranty. That's our 281 series. I have a couple questions here. Um, regular mount is pull side. Top jam is push side. Parallel arm is push side. And they, there was another question that asked about the picture here that we're showing. It says it looks like it's pull side. That is pull side, that is regular arm mount. Any questions on the 281 series? Let's jump over to our next product series, our 351 series. Now, the 351 is also an ANSI grade one, extended cycle testing, inch and a half diameter piston, brass valves, pressure relief valves, universal mounting, extended cycle testing. We have a 25 year warranty on this closer as well. The, one of the differences between 
The 351 and the 281 is the material of the closer, cast iron versus cast aluminum. Now, there are competitors out there that will write a spec that says they have to be cast iron. Only cast iron will do. I've sold both over the years, and my opinion, for what it's worth, is a door closer is designed for a specific purpose. If that door closer meets and exceeds the requirements and the closer operates and the fluid stays inside, the material doesn't matter. The aluminum, the alloy that they use now is much better than the alloys of 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So years ago, they could have a, uh, a comparison. The aluminum people always said that the cast iron material that they make their bodies out of can be more porous, which could allow leakage. And the aluminum can be cast to tighter tolerance, which just means less machining, which means less porosity. But again, we are not ones to decide whether we use cast iron or cast aluminum because we sell both. We have extended cycle testing for durability on both products. The other difference between the 281 and the 351 is it does not have the install bracket. You see the uh, closer mounts straight through the door. So we can give you aluminum grade one with a 25 year warranty or cast iron grade one with a 25 year warranty. The choice is yours. Let's look at our next product, which uh, straddles the industrial to architectural line. That is our 1431. It's also one piece aluminum body, 25 year warranty, also has an inch and a half piston diameter. So this meets the tenets of that specification other than it's a cast aluminum body. We've tested this again above 25 million cycles, 25 year warranty, same brass valves, same pressure relief valves, non-handed product. So this one kind of straddles that line. There is some money savings between this and the 351 and this and the 281. Know that it exists in that middle of the road. Let's keep looking at the uh, door closer offerings. The Sergeant 1331 is another cast aluminum closer. It sizes down from an inch and a half diameter piston to an inch and a quarter is a grade one certified product, inch and a quarter piston diameter, captured brass valves with pressure relief valves. And it does also carry a 25 year warranty. And the footprint of the door closer is the same footprint as the Norton 8000 and the Yale 3000 series body, which gives you a solution for a product. So let's talk about comparisons here. The 281. The 281 closer, we will absolutely write into a spec and be happy going up against the LCN 4040 series, the 4000 series, the Corbin Russwin uh, DC 8000 series, as well as the Norton 9500. Those are all cast iron closers. When you look at the 351 series, that's cast aluminum. There are players out there. Uh, Stanley has a closer, the, the I wanna say the 4550, which is their top closer, which is inch and a half diameter piston aluminum. Uh, Dorma also has an inch and a half piston uh, aluminum uh, closer. Again, they've all been tested and they can show that extended cycle testing. When you get into the 1431, uh, we look at the uh, LCN. They have a 1400 series, I believe, as well. This one also plays against the Corbin Rustwin DC 6000, even though there's a difference in piston diameter. It's an inch and a quarter for Corbin versus an inch and a half here, but that's where they, they play in that market. The 1331, there are closers out there available from LCN. They now offer a cast aluminum closer with the same uh, style footprint. Uh, Falcon has a closer, Dorma has a closer, Norton has a closer, Yale has a closer. Let's talk about a unique closer now. Remember I was talking about the track arm type closer and how it was the least efficient? Well, let's talk about a unique product that Asa Abloy manufactures. 
to help meet ADA. It's our 422 series, formerly our 421 series. And this closer, instead of a typical rack and pinion method, uses a ellipse shaped cam that is designed that rubs against two independent pistons. And the edges of the pistons have bearings installed on them. And what happens is the design of the cam is made so that when you're opening the door closer, it actually gets easier to open. As it closes, it, at the very end, the cam is shaped. There's a little ellipse in it where it drops into that ellipse and it gives you a little bit of extra oomph at the end. This is how we get to ADA forces on that. This closure is something that we would use in those applications where you need to meet ADA. It is cast aluminum. It utilizes two inch and a half diameter pistons with roller bearings on the edges of them. It is only available track mount. So that goes against what I told you. Track mount on a rack and pinion closer is the least efficient. The cam action is only available in track mount. We have a 10 year warranty on this closer. Uh, we brought this technology from a sister company uh, in Europe. Let me show you a, a uh, video of how the cam action door closer works. The Sargent 421 Cam Action Door Closer features a revolutionary design that combines the aesthetics of a track type closer with superior performance. Our Cam Action Closers are incredibly efficient. The secret is this unique cam assembly. Closing forces are applied to the spindle through the continuously smooth surface of the cam and roller bearing follower. The combination of the piston and cam design greatly increases efficiency. The results are astonishing. On doors equipped with cam action closers, the strength required to pull the door open remains easy throughout the entire opening range. On doors using a rack and pinion closer with a track, the effort required to open the door rises exponentially as the door is opened. There's also a difference in how each door will close. The cam action closer applies a consistent amount of force across the entire closing range, and the closing force actually rises at the last moment, right when the door needs extra force to set the latch. The force of a rack and pinion closer with track decreases as the door closes, providing the least amount of force at latch. Simply put, the Sargent 421 Cam Action Door Closer is the most efficient surface-mounted door closer on the market today. This means that a door equipped with this closer will feel light to open, yet still have plenty of power to overcome light stack pressure or other problems at latch. Sargent Cam Action Technology, combining the very best in aesthetics, performance, and innovation. And again, the current generation of that door closer is the 422. The 421 was the predecessor to it, but they haven't updated the videos yet. And we're always asked, does anybody else offer a cam action door closer? Here in the US, there's only one other company that makes a cam action door closer. That's Dorma, uh, their TS-83, I believe, is a cam action type door closer. So that would limit a lot of the other uh, competitors out there from being able to provide. Again, we don't specify this on every opening, but there are applications. Let's go back to another rack and pinion type closer. This is our entry level or utility offering type closer. That's the 1131 series, 1131, which is a aluminum body, inch and a quarter diameter piston, captured valves, size one through six, we put a 15 year warranty on this closer. This is something that is usually done uh, for storefronts and for over the counter and value engineered sales. And the note at the bottom, the footprint matches industry standard. When we talk about industry standard on a utility closer, that is the Norton 1601, Yale 51. That closer is Probably that footprint is the most common, the most widely used closer in the US. You can buy that footprint from everyone. You know, quite frankly, results may vary. There are some import companies that uh, offer this footprint closer and they're importing it and they say it's designed to meet grade one. Well, 
again, we want to make sure designed or actually meets or actually exceeds. And the price points on these closers vary based on that information. If you want a product that has been tested above and beyond, it's going to be at the premium price point. If you want a closer that is designed to look like that and to fill an opening, then it's going to be at a lower price point. We had a question about the warranty on the 422 series. Why is the warranty on the 422 series only 10 year? Well, that's uh, because we've never had to test it beyond that. You know, it's the only, you know, it's only made by Asa Abloy and one other brand at this point. And if extended uh, cycle testing is required and we force each other to do that as other manufacturers come out with a cam action door closed, then we certainly will. So let's talk about arm options for the door closer. Sargent's UO is their universal arm. That gives you that tri-pack mounting. If you specify O, that is for our standard arm. If you add an H to the arms, that is hold open. Z is for an extra deep reveal arm. P is for parallel arm. The P10 is our heavy duty parallel arm. If I'm comparing against uh, people, that is kind of the, our heavy duty parallel arm is like the EDA arm from LCN. It's a heavy, rigid, uh, riveted type arm you can, cannot take apart. Our PS is our positive stop heavy duty parallel arm. That would be like the Cush from LCN. And our CPS is a positive cushion stop, which is like their spring Cush from LCN. And they're heavy duty forged uh, arms. And the nice thing about it between the 351, the 1431, and the 281, all these arms are interchangeable. They will fit on the spindles. So you have a lot of heavy duty availability for stocking distributors. You don't have to stock all those closures with all those specialty arms. You can stock the arms separate. Notable options for the door closer. Uh, special door thickness. If you're putting through bolts on it, you might want to specify it's a thicker door so we can give you longer screws. If you want uh, torque screws, that is the security type screw that uh, you have to have a special screwdriver to operate. That's a 36 dash. TB is for through bolts. We showed you the delayed action in that video. That would be a DA prefix. They also have a ABS plastic cover available as a option, as well as a full metal cover. The difference between the ABS plastic and the standard plastic is the ABS is molded color through. With our cast iron closers and our steel arms, we offer an SRI option. That is a uh, special rust inhibitive primer that kind of helps in those areas where you're su uh, subject to having any kind of corrosion, things like that. It'll help that closer last a lot longer. Take a quick look at our nomenclature. The door closer nomenclature, we always start with our options. We're showing you a few different options there. The series would be next. Next would be the closer arms themselves. And any of those that needed a uh, holder, you would add an H onto that as well. On the regular top jam and parallel, you have the option of a friction hold open. With the positive stop and the CPS arm, you have a thumb turn option. The finishes that are then specified, Sargent uses a two or three letter code for their finishes, which will correspond in the catalog to the ANSI proper finishes. We also can offer the closers with plated covers and or plated arms. And if it's a handed product, then you would add the handing at the end. Any questions on the door closers? All 
All right, let's uh, keep pushing on. We'll do a part number exercise here and do some pricing. So we're asking for an institutional grade closer, inch and a half piston diameter with a parallel heavy duty arm with through bolts. We want a metal cover and we want 689 finish. Let's look at Sargent's nomenclature. The series of the closer, 281. The arm is a P10 because we asked for a heavy duty parallel arm. The cover, MC prefix tells us it's a metal cover. The through bolts is a TB. The finish, EN in Sargent nomenclature. And the metal cover is handed, so you would have to, to specify the hand of the closer, right hand or left hand. Remember, there's no such thing as a reverse bevel closer. So if you're following along with the price book, let's go to the, uh, well, let's take a look at the part number first. That is a TB, MC, 281, P10, EN, and you specify the handing last. Now we're going to look at the door closer pricing. We go to the Sargent price book, catalog page DC3. And you'll notice that on DC3, we have all of our industrial closers together, the 1431, the 281, and the 351. So we want to come down. We find our arm mounting, which was a P10, heavy-duty parallel arm. And we come across that row to the 281 and we find our list price, $640. That's for the 281 P10 in the EN finish. You'll notice all of the painted finishes for the closers are the same list price. But we asked for an industrial grade closer with an inch and a half piston diameter. Don't all three of those closers meet that spec? So you save a little bit of money by going to the 351 and a little bit more money by going to the 1431. So again, there are options. Speaking of options, let's take a look at the uh, options because we have to add for through bolts and a metal cover on this door closer. The facing page, DC2, has all the options available for that closer. So we find the metal cover. The note says, handed, indicate right hand or left hand. $17 list price ad for that. If we go further down to find the through bolts. $6 ad. So our total list price for the TBMC 281 P10 by EN finish is $640 plus the $17 plus the $6 comes up to $663 total. Let's take a look at another closer. This next one, I couldn't find a picture of the right finish. So I have a little finish uh, swatch right beside it. So we're asking for an architectural grade closer, inch and a quarter piston diameter, regular arm mount, hold open with a full cover, 695 finish. Our series, 1331, cover, full cover standard. Our arm, we're asking for the JH because it was a hold open arm, top jam. Our handing, maybe field reversible. Our finish is EB. So what does our part number look like there? 1331, JH, EB. We went to our price book section, page DC8 is where our 1331 and 1131 door closers are listed. The 1331s are at the top of the page, the 1131s are at the bottom of the page. So we come down to find our holder arm. We ask for the JH, come across to the finish, $462.